Welcome back. Now it's Saturday, right? Just to let you we in sight. Do you want to go out in that and make a film? No, I don't think so. So what we're gonna do is do the ten thousand mile review in the shed. Glasses. Oh you further ado, glasses. Ah, getting old. Right, okay, so let's start scratch. So 14 months ago. Bottom Royal Enfield, Classic 350, so much wanted the army one. They never came out to this country in green and sand. Moto GB would not import them, despite myself and another probably a dozen guys on the Facebook Classic 350 Reborn, as it was known then, group asked, you know. I actually emailed Moto GB and they didn't even bloody replied, so quite happy that they've not got Royal Enfield now. Um, so, <clears throat> cost and value, I broke this up, right? Let's break this down simply. We are going to have cost and value. Usability, as in day-to-day -day usability. Um, reliability. Changes to the stock bike which is needed or not. Five. The top speed question, which is always asked, and it's touring ability. We've already then I've discussed commuting, so we'll go into that. Any negatives about the bike? And then I'm going to summarise my own views on this bike and leave you a good summarise of this bike. So, so running costs. I bought this, it was £4,000 plus on the road charges in July 2022. They are now, I believe, £4,400 on the road charges, so they went up, as everyone did. So that's in 2022. I bought an XR400 in 2000 for £4,299. So, in today's world of £5,000 upward motorbikes, this is an absolute bargain. Now, the question is, is it a bargain? Well, it is not if it doesn't work, doesn't last, falls to bits. And this company is on it. For value for money, absolutely on it. So anyway, let's get on with that. So, cost and value, discuss the cost. Second hand now. I mean, you get the meteors for 3,000. These will be about 3.5, 3, 3 second hand. You're getting nothing trading, I know that. But privately, you might get one for three grand, you don't know. Um, running costs. You're talking a minimum of 80 to 90 miles per gallon, minimum, even hammering it. Um, is it the other day we were down the borders, it was 140 miles on 10 pounds worth of E5. And that's not the cheap E10. I have run it on E10 fuel, but I usually just run it on E5. I think you get more miles to the gallon, so it works out cheaper. Um, service costs, right? So every 6,000 miles of service, it's roughly £40 from Hitchcock's UK for two litres of so clean oil and the oil filters and the rocker cover gasket, which you'll need for doing your tappets. Also, the services can be done yourself easily, even the tap adjustment. It's not rocket size. This is a bike built for a world market in countries where there isn't bike shops. There's just people on street corners or workshops that fix bikes and they're designed for you to be able to fix wherever you live, wherever you ride them, whatever you want to do. Do that yourself. The road tax is £52 a year. My insurance with one year's no claims discount, this renewal at 52 years old was 136 quid. So that is under 200 pound a year to tax and insure and roughly 90 to 100 to the gallon average. Um, you run out on tube tires, which are cheap to buy compared to tubeless. We'll go into that in a bit about tubeless versus tube. We know which one's better, but this is what you've got. And uh, there's a couple of ways you can get around that. If you buy a stealth model with a black engine, 
you've got no polish in. And if you buy an army model, you've got even less chrome. Um, or you can do as I did. I ratted mine. I de chromed mine when I did the army paint job. This was a stealth grey. See in the picture. Um, I just painted what's grey, army green, and I sprayed the fork lower black. And uh, so basically, my bikes lived outside for the whole time I've owned it, which is 14 months. I've been running through the winter. I was pressing a daily service and my van engine blew up. And the condition, well, you can see for yourself, it's perfect for having been on salted roads. Unbelievable condition. The, the forks, uh, sorry, the, the spoke, the forks will tarnish on a stock silver fork and the spokes will tarnish up a bit because they're non stainless. But you know, it's a £4,000 bike. So you've got a non-stainless exhaust as well. Um, but it's a four grand bike. What do you want for four grand? What do you get for four grand now? Now, overall, it's still got hardly any corrosion or rust on it. In fact, it's got no rust on it, really. I did treat it with um, GT85 to begin with. And then it got um, a bit of lanyard guard painted onto the spokes and stuff. Um, Sorry, let's sort that out. So, okay. So, usability for everyday use, not a problem. Thing. But for day-to-day -day use, like I use mine as my transport, it's been fantastic. The big mud guards help keep you dry. I did a front mud guard. Um, yeah, if you want. You leave it outside, give it a wash once a week with car wax, spray down stuff, clean your chain every thousand miles. Standard motorbike maintenance, really. And it will go wrong. I got told at high school I had the worst handwriting in my year at school and make none of my life. I like to meet that English teacher now. English teacher now. So reliability, what's it been like? So we'll talk about the known faults from other owners. The speedo, the speedo sticking, so when you switch your engine off, the speedo goes down to, neutral, uh, to tw about 10 or 20 and stops, depends, different ones. So there's been a sticking speedo issue and a lot of the owners have had them replaced under warranty. There's been a little bit of delay, I believe, the warranty parts because there's a swap over going on between, in the UK, from MotoGB and, well, Enfield official so, but I think that's again sorted out now, now, now. The original chain life can be short. Now, on a four grand bike, you don't expect the best chain to be fitted, and it's not a, a high-end chain. And my chain actually only lasted four miles before it just started stretching all the time. So the sprockets were still good. So as soon as it started stretching, I instantly bought a DIDX round chain. I've used them on all my previous motorbikes and they're brilliant. And that chain's now on 6,000 miles and it's just been adjusted for its third time. So think about that. That's a lot of gear changes, a lot of touring. It's never in top gear for much longer than 10 minutes if I'm on the A9 or something like that. So, uh, yeah. There is a lot of reports of too much grease in the relays and the headlight um, bulb mount socket onto the bulb and the speedo as well, as well, the electrical connection with the speedo. I stripped all them out, sprayed them with uh, WD-40 which more or less degreased them, sucked them all back in. I did have a lot of intermittent engine management light would come on. Uh, so you'd be riding to work and the orange light would come on. Bike's got oil in it, everyone's working, who knows. So, switching it on, starting it, running it, switching it off three times tends to get rid of that. And those glitches though have all stopped since I cleaned all the relays, degreased them. And I did mine quite late on, about four or five thousand miles probably. So, since six thousand miles at its last service, nothing has went wrong with that bike. No engine management, management lights come on, nothing. It has needed no oil top-ups between, and I've never put oil on it since I got it, 
and it's 300 mile service at 800 miles I was late getting it done and then it got a 6,000 mile oil change which I did myself you'll see the video on that and uh, despite going away touring three times three big trips up north Scotland it's not needed oil it's never needed oil um, very very impressed at that and I've got Hondas had Hondas they needed oil to top up so did Yamaha XTs trail bikes so um, reliability for me has been bomb proof there's I don't I can't actually I've, I, I've never adjusted the clutch yet I've not um, not not tightened up the throttle cable I've not, I've not done nothing I changed the, sh the brakes right I've changed the pads actually to centered I, I mistakenly ordered centered um, when they were getting down a bit at the front and I realised after I, I bought them, I, I should order sort of standard resin pads, not centred. Centred were for off-road, they're for mud. And I've had in my head, with mountain biking, we ride with centred pads and I just automatically ordered them. So I went back to um, normal resin um, Brembo pads and brakes are back to better than they were. So yeah, it's not needed anything. I mean, yeah. So, that's all good. So, the big, one of the big two things. One's the top speed, the next one. Changes needed to a stock bike. Is there any needed? I've, and I've wrote in capital letters, none. Now, all right, <laughs> I've changed loads. Now, when I, these came out, everybody thought they were restricted with air filter or exhaust with a cat. Everybody thought a cat restricted them. And most of the early owners of Meteors and then these a year later, a lot of them got the decat from Hitchcock. So you can buy one from eBay as well from India. They put a free air floor pipe on it. They bought a full stainless Hitchcock's pipe um, and the DNA air filler, which is like a k &M. Power, do you get any more? you get a little bit and it's like maybe one horsepower and I believe Hitchcock's have just done our video using the new um, J series bike and uh, they've basically put all that on and they've dynoed it and they got like one horsepower more see the pants the tiniest bit but not much but this is the question I'll ask why what i've done this for i'll tell you why i wanted it to sound right i didn't want a hair uh sort of you know quiet little quiet but we're in bike i wanted the bike to sound like a motorbike the induction roar is a love hate thing i love it i absolutely love the noise of it and that punjab silencer it does have a sound uh baffle on it you can't put a thing right through it Right, we'll get on to that in a bit. India parts, cheap parts, rusty as hell. That's just a bit of stainless instead of the cat. You've seen all this on my, my films. The noise my makes is quite a unique noise. And I know a lot of you comment on my bike's noise. And when you hear it flying by when someone else is on it, it's like, that sounds so cool. So I've, I've, I've achieved what I set out to do, which is a, it's a modern bike that sounds a bit and looks a bit like an old bike. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, does it really need anything? You can, I, if I get another one, and I will buy a second one, when the time comes I get another motorbike, this will always be kept in here. I'm going to make more space because it's going in for the winter. Yes, it is going inside. I'm going to, I have so much respect for this bike. It's getting a wee treat. It's coming inside for winter. Um, the body deserves it. It's a good bike. Yeah, what did I change? I did change the bars at first um, to those desert bars, but they weren't long enough in the end, so the switch gears, so the levers were sitting. So I went back to stock bars and added a, some sort of aftermarket cross brace, which I think came off a mountain bike or something. So um, the things I changed, most obvious thing I changed was the tyres, the trail tyres, and that's one of the most viewed um, films on my channel. 
from a playlist for the Enfield. And it makes up for me a massive difference on the country roads where I ride. They're a bit buzzy and annoyed, you can hear them, you know. But um so I put tire seal uh sealant in the inner tubes, touch wood, not had a puncture yet. I know a lot of folk it just takes a nail to go in an inner tube and a tire and come out and you've got a puncture. Um and I don't want I want to minimise the problem of getting that back wheel out in the middle of nowhere. And we'll get to that one thing in a minute. Um, so I added, added the engine bars, the sump guard, after I changed the exhaust system. So I thought when I bought it, it was restricted like everyone else thought. I also thought the original silencer would last two minutes and all rust and rot. Looking at a lot of 1990s well in fields, which are pretty rusty. So I thought it'd be a good thing to keep the original pipe and cat and then just slot them on for the MOT when it's needed. Um, so that was my idea of doing that. The filter came after that. Um, and the... Right, I'm losing myself here. Pull your seat replacement, rear rack as well. That was one of the first things I did. Then I bought pannier rails and bags from India, more than them in a bit. Uh, and uh, I put a halogen headlight and a whiter headlight, same wattage, 55, 60, a Halford's bulb, 12 pound or something. And then I added a, a cheap um, mesh guard from eBay from Hong Kong, which was like five pound. Um, and some nuts and bolts, brass nuts on the end, see that wing nuts. Uh, so the black and white show plates, that's quick release at the front, but it's got screws in it this now. Back's velcroed on, legal or not, we're not even going to go there. I'll put them on for photos or whatever, and on a country road, just leave them on. Um, I got a bit of juice with that actually on one of my f the Facebook Scotland group, so I just left the group because I couldn't be bothered with folk like that. It's my bike, I'll do what I want. So, big one, the top speed, right? Living with it. Now, this is the most controversial thing on this bike because it only does 70 flat out. Now, I've come back to bikes buying this after seven or eight years without a bike. Previous to that, I had 600, 650cc, single cylinder enduro, uh, trail bikes, Yamaha, XT, Honda XRs, a lot of Honda XRs I had. And I was used to sitting in a 70 on a trail bike because you're like this, you're a sail. Um, so, is it fast enough? Well, it's more than fast enough for touring in Scotland. I'll say that. You've got a 70 mile an hour speed limit on motorways, right? Most folks say A, I know that. Um, you got the A9 though, to the M90. It's all um, speed thingy cameras. So, in theory, if you behave yourself, you ain't gonna get done and lose your license with this bike. But it's more than fast enough for having fun. And that's the magic of this bike. It somehow does that. It gels everything in to one and it just makes it so enjoyable to ride. Look at me grinning. Uh, you know a good bike, when you park it up at the car park, a cafe or whatever, you walk away, you turn around and look at it. Or you look out the window at it. Or you sit in your back garden looking at it. Or you sit in your shed and just sit looking at it. That's the best sign of something enjoyable. Touring wise, yeah, top speeds more than enough for touring around Scotland as I've proved three times, three big weekends. I did the NC 500 in three days. That was 1100 miles. I, I bombed round and just camped two nights. And uh, the first day I rode to Ullapool from here in Dunbar. And the time I pulled into the campsite, I'd done 430 something miles. I got off that bike thinking I wouldn't be able to walk the next day and I'd have an arse like a baboon. And you know what? Fine. It's absolutely amazing. And that's the standard seat. I'm going to buy a touring seat for it just because they're 70 pounds or something. And I think it'll be worth doing. I'll get a black one and it could look better. Um, so yeah, 1100 miles in three days, not sore at all. I've never owned a bike like that. I've been so comfortable. My Transalp, was horrendous. 
in the end from 600 trans up for comfort it was awful that is like a sofa it's amazing so after i did the nc 500 but month later we went up to the isle of sky to see g's pal she used to work with george and that was a 700 mile trip non-stop up there with one fuel stop um yes that was 700 miles in three days and then we sorry 600 miles and then just two weeks ago i did three days cromarty first so i rode up day nine then took the Glenshee Road, so we went over um, basically your highest roads in Scotland, um, Cairnwell and the Lecht, um, right up to Inverness, and then we went round Cromarty Firth, and then we went round the Maury Coast, the Angus Coast, met wee Mark just after Stonehaven, at Stonehaven, and we rode down to Montrose and I rode home. And again, brilliant on those roads, You've seen the films they speak for themselves um so that's that's kind of where we're at so far so negatives right there's only one and it's that back wheel and getting it out yourself because the mudguard stops you pulling the wheel straight out now watch all the films the videos and what they do is the guy takes the axle out, pulls out all, drops it down, takes the sprocket off, the chain off, and then his pal comes along and does that. And he pulls the wheel out at 45 degrees. That's all fine. Now, imagine a scenario where you are middle of the highlands, nail through the back tyre, even though you've got your seal on. You've got your spare inner tube. So, back wheel off, change the tube, fine. Try doing it on your own, it's not easy. I tried it out there, I did a video, and you may remember the bike rolled forward, the centre stand came up, the bike was lying on its arse. Nah, could have, that could have damaged a disc or something, I was very lucky. So I got my thinking hat on, I next tried putting blocks under the centre stand to lift it up to give you more room. Problem with that is you've got to lift that wheel back up yourself with one hand and feeding that caliper. It's a crap design. I, I don't care what anyone says, that's awful. Um, and while it's fine to get uh, three years um, breakdown cover, Royal Enfield will give you that with a bike new. I'm just set off for a day, for three days, four days up north, touring, camping or whatever. I don't want to be coming home my first day with my flat back tyre, I want to fix it and keep going. Even if it means me detouring in Inverness and buying another spare inner tube, though I would just patch my inner tubes, I've got patches as well. Loads of stuff. I've done a video on that, someone said I was over the top with what I carry, but I don't want to be sitting for three, four hours waiting on a recovery truck and then have about a six or seven hour drive home. They don't bring you straight home, don't matter what anyone says, they take you to like Glasgow and swap you over. So anyway, so I did think about all this. So a ratchet strap, short ratchet straps in there that goes onto the centre stand to the front. That locks the centre stand. Then I tie up the front brake lever and then I lean the bike onto something, be it a pole or a fence post, and I'll tie that lever onto the fence post as well. So all the stuff's in there to do it. And then with the bike lying at 45 degrees, I can use both hands and pull the wheel out. And I'm gonna out there do a video on that just to show, but you shouldn't have to do all that. So my idea is gonna be with this bike, is I'm actually gonna put a hinge on my back mudguard and I'm gonna make it so you just take two bolts out and that'll hinge up and attach. And that's what the old uh, Bullet 500 does. It does, it basically, it makes that problem go away. You know, you've still got a big mudguard you can lift out of the way. And that is the only fault I've got on this bike. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, 
I'm speechless to find anything wrong with that sort of thing. It's the best thing I've bought. So happy about it. And the next big question is, will I buy another? Of course I will. So the plan is I'm trying to sell a bicycle up there. It's a very expensive bike, so that's a thousand pound bike to sell. And I'm gonna buy a one two five mark. I'm gonna get one, I have to get one. Three reasons. I want one to put in the back of the van. I want uh, let Daniel do his CBT, Glenda's lad. And then I just think they look so cool. Hence why there's a whole bit of room getting cleared in the shed. Uh, and then once this gets to like three years old, maybe four, I want to keep running this. It'll get run through the winter because I run my bike all year. So I'll run this this winter again, out playing. I'm going to be commuting. I might as well take the car to work and then get out and have fun at the weekends. Rain, snow, shine. Um, but, but it'll be good to see just how many miles this bike does. Um, engines are going to be 30, 40,000 easy. If it's done 10,000, I'm not used any oil. Unless something eternally goes bang. Um, worry about that if it does. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, last thing I'll leave you with, right? Right, so I wanted to buy a British bike to go with my Willis Jeep. And uh, four eight grand now for a, a dispatch bike. And it's, that's an 80 year old bike. Like an old Jeep, it's, well, they're probably more reliable than a motorbike. But, um, you know, I want a bike I can go out at half five in the morning in the dark, hit a button and it starts. There's no oil underneath it. Nothing, nothing to worry about get to work every time I want to go to work on it. And then I go for a detour home, make a film, blah, blah, blah. And uh, if you rewind to the 50s, right? And you know, your our granddads had Triumphs and BSA aerials, Nortons, you know? Or we grew up with our grandfathers who had motorbikes and they had the cars, they'd take you out as kids on a Sunday. And dad or grandpa would be under the bonnet cleaning the points on the car and cleaning the plugs and stuff. And if he said to them, how would you like a modern Ford Focus car? And it gets serviced out with 10,000 miles and nothing, you won't need to touch anything. You never get your hands dirty. You just give it a wash once every whatever. They'd be like jumping at the chance. And if a motorcyclist from the 50s had the chance to ride one of these ABS, GPS, speed or whatever, all the mod cons, fuel injection, and that one of these or interceptor or anything, you know, anything modern, they would jump at it. I don't care what anyone says, they would jump at it to know they just sit on it every morning, hit that button, and it's going to go. And that to me, there you go. And as I say, if you park a bike up, you walk away, you turn and look at it and smile, and it's making you happy. So, Anyway, that's my 10,000 mile review, bit of a waffle. Um, I've got loads more films to make, loads of places to go. Um, yeah, so thanks again. Um, as always, thanks for all the comments. And thanks for all the comments on my, on my uh, garage as well. It's gonna, it's getting gutted out. I was, I was supposed to do it today, but I've been farting a bit. Um, it's getting a floor scrubbed. It's getting repainted. It's actually getting white floor. So it's it's bright for the winter, and uh, so you drop in and you can see it. So it'll be hard to keep clean, but that doesn't matter. So um, yeah, thanks for watching. Leave a comment. I'll get back to you as always. And bye for now.